Well, hi everyone, and welcome to tonight's lecture, which is the next installment in the New Models Lecture Series. Um, the series, which began last autumn, has invited architects and other interdisciplinary practitioners to discuss how their work can change the models around which society is organized. Each event proposes a new model to address how we can shift power structures, socioeconomic forces, and structural inequalities present in society today to give us new tools to rethink the world around us. Over the past year, a series of new models have been presented to underline the need to redesign institutions, redress who has access to funding, reverse the lack of representation in public art, embrace physical and digital spaces of collective care and mutuality, um, ah, sorry, and um, find new forms of community-led practice, invent new forms of recognition, and address the interconnected and intersectional crises threatening the future of our planet, with more to come in the year ahead. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Manishay Verghese and I'm the head of the AIS Public Program. And I'm delighted to introduce tonight's speaker who through her practice has really strived to transform the profession into a more inclusive, ecologically sensitive and diverse place. Sumitha Singer is an award-winning architect, academic and author. She served on many REBA committees over 25 years and even set up its Equality Forum Architects for Change as just one example in a career spent campaigning for inclusive change. She is a non-executive director of Moorfields Eye Hospital and author of many books on practice, healthcare design, um, designing with scarce resources and women in architecture. In addition, she's a trustee of four charities and an academic and recently was awarded an OBE um, for services to architecture. And her practice ecologic architects champions green design and energy saving building techniques, but is also paired with a design charity, Charashila, that works with local communities across the globe to ensure that they are properly served by their public spaces. I was really lucky to meet Sumitha a few years ago after being commissioned to write a profile about her for the Bloomsbury Encyclopedia for Women in Architecture. And after reading and researching her impressive career, I realized I had to meet her to understand her trajectory through architecture in more detail. And since then have been constantly amazed by the many projects, initiatives, institutions, and publications that she has created, participated in, and supported. Tonight, she's gonna to discuss a new model for design creativity, challenging architects to overturn existing power structures and prioritize those human and non-human or natural voices that currently aren't being heard or accounted for in the design of our cities and spaces. At a time when we're facing not just a climate crisis, but also crises of health and systemic injustice, do we need to start thinking of a different way of designing? To quote her lecture description, an ecological way of thinking means not just disinvestment from the carbon producing economy and delinking from non-ethical supply chains, but also disinvestment from toxic ways of working. It embraces creative, collaborative and participative ways of working with the people and the planet. Before I hand over to Sumitha, a few notes on the format. Um, she's gonna give her lecture and following that, I'll ask her a few initial questions. Um, before opening it up to the audience for a wider discussion. But at any point during the talk, um, just please post your um, questions in the chat. And then in the discussion part, if you'd like to ask the question yourself, just use the raise hand function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And I can unmute you to ask it yourself. Um, and especially in the discussion, if you feel comfortable to do so, it'd be great if you could turn on your camera. So at least we can feel like we're in the same space, although these lectures are still being held on Zoom for now. Um, I'm, I guess all that's left to say is that I'm really delighted to have Sumitha here tonight for this talk and as part of this series. So please join me in welcoming her to the AA. Thank you very much, Manija. That's a very generous introduction to me. So, um, oh my God, it says your internet connection is unstable. <laughs> Let's hope. Don't, you don't worry, we can, we can hear you. So don't okay. worry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Um, just to kind of expand on what Manija said already, I, I grew up in India, in New Delhi, in a, in a very poor family. My family of five, three sisters and parents lived in one room with a leaking roof. Age 13, I decided to become an architect, possibly from being fed up with this one room we called our home. I did not have architects in the family, but at the School of Planning and Architecture, I came across strong role models such as Arunati Roy, who was to become a prominent, prominent novelist and environmental campaigner, and female tutors such as the architect Rebati Kamath. I struggled a lot because we never had money for even clothes or food, and I had to work my way through the expensive course. 
My father warned me that I would never earn enough money as an architect, but then who, which teenager listens to their parents? I finished on a high with a gold medal and international design award, and then got a scholarship to study a postgraduate degree in environmental design at Cambridge University. After that, I settled in London and started my environmental and community focused practice, Ecologic. But it was a struggle for me as one connection to the UK. I got to know British culture gradually. Um, when I was asked to bring a bottle for a party, I brought along a well washed jam jar. But on a more serious note, I found the position of women architects was quite poor in the UK, unlike uh, India let alone a migrant woman from an ethnic minority. I became the chair of women in architecture and then set up a forum to tackle wider inequalities within architecture. Architects for Change at the RIBA. Since 1996, I've served on many RIBA committees, including the Commission for Ethics and Sustainable Development and Professional Standards. I've now been elected to the RIBA Council for the second time. In 2013, I also became a non-executive director in the NHS, as Manija said, thus fulfilling my father's dreams that I should work in healthcare. I'm also the trustee of four charities, including one that I set up, and I will talk about their work later. My eclectic and peripatetic experiences have turned me into a writer and advocate for human rights and the environment. Sorry, is this meant to move me? Um, ah, okay. Um, so these are some of my books that I've written um, as I've gone along. And uh, they chart my journey for the nature of architecture. As you can see, I've moved from architecture of rapid change. And when I became um, a healthcare, in, I've written two books on healthcare. So what am I proposing today? I propose that the new model for design creativity needs to embrace ecological thinking. The word ecology is actually quite new, invented in the late 19th century by the German zoologist Ernst Haeckel. It denotes the scientific study of the relationship of living beings to their environments. I see ecological thinking in our relationships and connections with each other. The planet supports large numbers of living beings, all in an ecological chain with each other. They range from viruses to blue whales. Connections between nature became even more apparent during the COVID pandemic, which involves a viral transmission to humans via secondary host. It affected the building industry when work at construction sites stopped, office spaces become, became redundant, and supplies of materials dipped. Accord, according to the ONS, building material prices have now risen by 20%, with a particular shortage of timber and steel. The second aspect of ecological thinking is diversity. Diversity supports ecology. This aspect is within our bodies as well, with a diverse range of bacteria living inside us. That diversity also extends outside us with different ethnicities, languages, and cultures that humans have. Just like how biodiversity helps ecology, workplace diversity increases creativity and productivity, including revenue by 20%. Um, Thus, diversity is a hallmark of ecological and innovative design. Another aspect of ecological thinking is ethics. Ethics have, has had an impact on what we buy and use and therefore how we influence our natural resources. Our choices to use certain building materials that do harm to the natural environment and our choices to advocate for spatial justice both arise from ethical concerns. But historical issues need to be examined as well. Um, as Buddhism says, to see where we are now, understand the past. To see where we are going, look at the present. So this is a 19th century painting by John Gast called American Progress and shows how the concept of progress was linked to settler colonialism and exploitation. This flimsily clad uh, giant white woman, who's called Lady Columbia, 
um, uh, she moves westward. So it's like taking over all the lands of the United States. And you see at the side, um, you see the indigenous people and a herd of buffaloes are seen fleeing her and the settlers. As industrial revolution based on extractive economy has contributed to the dioxide in our atmosphere, and so the wealth of many rich uh, nations have also built on colonial exploits that include human and nature. The poor countries are now expected to keep pace with rich countries in the fight against climate crisis. This is an unfair expectation. For example, the whole continent of Africa emits just 3% of greenhouse gases. And yet the level of climate adaptation as agreed in the Paris COP21, that's uh, six years ago, is expected to be 50%. Compare this with the European Union, which is the third highest emitter of greenhouse gases, and where the existing building stock accounts for over 40% of the final energy consumption, and yet it will pay much less in energy in climate adaptation. Um, as we near COP26 next week, this graph by Jason Hickel, who's an economist, shows that majority of rich countries have already significantly exceeded their fair share of the carbon budget for two degrees. The zero by 2050 actually doesn't mean anything. So we see the biggest overshooters in this graph. You can see um, you know, John Gasp before, and we see again the United States of America, which is right at the top. The problem today, I think it was in today's um, BBC News, is that people who are living with wealth and comfort don't want to give those up. They believe in climate change, but they don't want to give it up. So, but today what I'm going to talk about is one thing, natural resources and how we must ecologic, how we must use ecological design in, in their use. So our survival depends on how we use the planet's resources. We can't live without the environment and without our planet and without the sources, resources that sustain us. The word economy also has a common origin with ecology. So our resources determine what we can do. I want to explore the main expression of architectural design, the resources used to build those designs. By resources, I mean building materials, people, and the planet. You've heard of the phrase, form follows function. Today, I want to say form follows materials, because everything we create, we create from material resources. Even the carbon dioxide and the greenhouse ga gases we produce come from the materials we process. Extraction and processing of materials result in harm to human and other life forms. On the other hand, judicious use of materials can also enhance our design creativity. Last year, amidst the COVID pandemic, a report that humanity was quietly devouring the earth when unnoticed. While the amount of material consumed has passed 100 billion tons in 2017, the proportion being recycled has gone down as well. This means that virgin materials are being used up while building waste is growing. Of this 100 billion, 50% was sand, clay, gravel and cement, all used for building purposes. Coal, oil and gas made of 15% and metal, metal ores made 10%. The final quarter comprised the plants and trees used for food and fuel. Thus over 60% of what we extracted from the planet has actually gone into um, our building industry or building related activities. And the third of those materials were actually wasted mostly going to landfill or mining spoil heaps. From the third of the materials that remained in use after a year, such as building and vehicles, 15% was emptied into the atmosphere as greenhouse gases. Nearly a quarter, including plastic, found its way into oceans. And I can tell you this, I take my students each year to see a building materials recycling factory near me. And the most problematic material of that is plastic. 
you can't recycle it uh, and reuse it. You can maybe do it once, but then what happens to it after that? So out of the 100 billion, a third of that was as waste generated from buildings and infrastructure. So if we go to the next um, uh, picture, this is a uh, triptych by the Dutch painter Hieronymus Bosch. And I got this specially for Manije because she has a special link to this. <laughs> um, maybe she might say what it is later on. But um, this, this, uh, this painting um, is called The Garden of Earthly Delights, except it doesn't show delights. It shows what Buddhism calls as three evils, greed, ego, and ignorance. So you can see these hordes of people that are doing all strange things, activities. And in my mind, I have uh, see, I, I think that this is all plastic stuff. You know, the humans uh, enjoying plastic, eating plastic, which is what's happening now. And, but unfortunately, if you see in the last uh, part of the triptych, you see what uh, fate awaits these humans. And I feel that this is where we are headed with our planetary um, consumption of resources and pollution. And if we go to the next slide, this is a photo of um, Hyde Park which is taken by a friend of mine who helps to clear it. And this is after a football celebration. And um, I think this is a modern version of the Garden of Earthly Delights, uh, or maybe a 21st century version, but it's quite horrific. And there, there was more, this is just one shot of it. So maybe I should have done a triptych of this um, shot as well. Um, sorry. Um, treating the world's resources as limitless and the belief in a linear economy are driving the planet to disastrous consequences. Sourcing local building materials should be a priority for all architects, followed by the reduction of material needs and reuse of waste. Recycling should be the last resort because many building materials cannot be usefully recycled or reused, and primary among them is plastic. Um, yeah, but even materials such as stone and concrete are not actually fully reusable. Uh, because of the water that's used to bind them or the that's used in there. Uh, most brick, bricks can be downcycled, again, because of cement mortar. Uh, presently, operational energy is given much more importance in buildings than embodied energy. But while energy efficiency of appliances has risen, embodied carbon and energy will rise as the planet loses its material resources. It, as, as we've seen, prices are already rising. Also, it's more complicated to understand embodied energy because it involves ethics, as, as, we, sh as we shall see later. To be resourceful is to be creative, and to be creative is to be resourceful. A new way of design creativity uses resources, whether they be natural or human in the way nature does. That kind of creativity produces architecture that contains goodness, beauty, and benefit. This idea of a triple value creation was um, propounded by the Japanese philosopher Tsunasaburo Makiguchi in the 20th century. So with that in mind, let's examine one particular building material, which happens to be the world's most loved material. After water, concrete is the most widely used substance on this planet. A typical concrete mixture is made up of roughly 10% cement, 20% air and water, 30% sand, and 40% gravel. The water that is used for making concrete needs to be clean enough to drink. And uh, cement that's used is, uh, if I can tell you, cement industry were a country, it would be the third largest producer of carbon dioxide in the world. Both cement used for making concrete and the concrete itself need clean sand. And that too, is a, and that too a particular type of sand is needed. You can't just go to the Sahara and get the desert, uh, desert sand. And sand takes a long time to be created from the gradual weathering of rocks over millions of years. So in a way, sand can be considered a non-renewable resource. 
Um, so now we see that with the addition of clean water, which is the most precious resource of this so-called blue planet, concrete has become the number one user of our planet's resources. This photo shows my village before and after sand mining. So for some of who are not there, sand is taken from all countries and being transported all over the world for construction projects. So you can see all the sand that I used to play in as a child. And you can see on the right side with screen what has happened as the land has been taken. For some people, sand is for play and relaxation. In my village, sand had many other uses from pottery making, cooking, cleaning, and religious ceremonies. This photo shows my father's funeral ceremony from three years ago. Normally, it would have been held on the sandy banks of the river, but as you can see, my family had to make do with this arrangement. Sand and clay have become the world's most trafficked minerals often carried out by criminal gangs. Such extractions put the local ecology and people in danger. And um, this is just from three days or four days ago. This is from BBC. Um, this is, a North, is in Norfolk. Um, and you can see here, two million cubic meters of sand has been brought into, uh, was brought in in 2019 to mitigate the effects of the rising sea, in, in sea there. But did anyone ask, where did the sand come from? This beautiful sand and, and this demand for um, from poor countries, from people of rich uh, nations uh, is relentless. So the fact that, you know, this statement, the fact that we hear that people used to lie awake can now sleep at night. But on the other hand, uh, the, the opposite of true is uh, of the people that live in villages. They are more prone to flooding, whereas these people uh, who live in rich countries are now helping themselves against climate change. Extraction and mining used illegal labor and play on the desperate plight of the poor to escape their circumstances. You will remember the tragic death of 39 people from Vietnam who were being trafficked in a lorry in October 2019, the same time as this sand came. They all came from the Mekong Delta, a region of Vietnam that has been stripped of its sand for various construction related projects. The ecological destruction also resulted in the destruction of the agricultural land and brought poverty to the people from which they sought to escape in that lorry. Unfortunately, they didn't make it. Um, so going back to Jason Hickel again, he argues for a twofold approach to overcome an economy based on extraction and exploitation of resources. First, for the rich nations to refuse to supply cheap labor and, law, and raw materials for the rich countries. Rich countries can either pay more for resources and labor imports from the poor countries, or they can rely on their own resources and labor. Since these, uh, these options would be more expensive, the rich countries need to find, uh, need to consume less or find resources locally. And that ideally is the best, but as we've seen, people don't want to let go of the, their comfort and their lifestyle in the rich countries. However, it's not as difficult as it sounds if we try. So, for example, consider the tried and tested vernacular traditions of countries that give us clues about local building resources. We can update and modernize vernacular material technology by using modern methods of construction, MMC, and incorporating them in the building inf information modeling. Both these processes can then be used uh, for reducing waste in design and construction. MMC can help in six areas to make construction more sustainable and ethical. Interestingly, this is, this is the sort of thinking that enabled the garment manufacturer Zara to keep going during the pandemic, as it managed to keep production going while sweatshops in Asia closed. It simply moved production closer to its market. But unlike Zara, I'm not advocating overproduction. I am for slow and participative design. 
the world has moved from abundance to scarcity of materials and space, but our designs have not responded to that new situation. We still design as if there are lots of resources. We, of course, now have ecological frameworks, green overlays, codes of conduct, and things to sign, such as architects declare, diversity and inclusion charters, and environmental standards such as BRIAM and LEED. Yet, despite these, the world of architecture remains quagmired in the past, past glory of abundance. Buildings are very complex creations with input from many different organizations, professions, and industries. Ecological thinking seems, seeks to unravel these complexities. Ecological thinking strives to create multiform, holistic, and replicable solutions. The commitment by individual architects and even architecture practices alone won't make a difference. We need policy and governmental changes alongside that. So um, let's, um, is, it, um, just, is it time to take a root and branch analysis to understand where we're going and to create a radically different way of designing? So this is just looking at something called ESG investing from the financial world. ESG stands for, um, for ecological, social and governance, corporate governance investing. So ESG actually grew from and the corporate um, um, social um, responsibility into a $30 trillion asset manage management scheme. So can architectural design also achieve similar kind of things? So if you, if you look at it, if you look at all the different aspects in here from climate change, biodiversity, health and safety, diversity, inclusion, that is all part of how we practice architecture. So um, I think it's possible to do that. And also in that process, create the triple value that Makiguchi envisaged. So I'm calling for three things. So first of all, obviously an inclusion of uh, ESG principles into design thinking. Uh, some aspects are already part of it, as I've described, you know, including corporate social uh, responsibility, uh, but we need to stop the greenwash. So um, just like the garment industry, for example, has reinforced, um, you know, or thinking about um, safety of people, about ethics and labor, the architecture industry also needs to start doing that. Um, then people also hold up the environmental product declarations, declarations, EPD, which details the impact of building products but that also needs to be rid of greenwash and uh, incorporate ethics into it. So if we look at this uh, particular example, this is a concrete product and I've taken the screenshot from an EPD of uh, concrete. So you, uh, you, if you read the amount of recycled material in it, it has got NA on it. Uh, most of the time, uh, if you look, if you study that, I've studied quite a few of these materials. Uh, you can see that uh, you do not see the recycled materials in it, or you don't see the source of where this material, sand and cement, has come from. So it's just useless, really, people saying uh, use EPD. Um, apparently, EPD is an independently ver verified and registered document that communicates transparent and comparable information about the life cycle environmental impact of products, but you actually need to go into it and see that it's basically greenwash again. So this is one of my projects where I tried to, very early on, I tried to um, um, incorporate some ideas that I've been talking about. So reusing by retrofitting buildings is also a way of reducing building waste. Around 80% of new buildings in Europe have already been built. So we find many empty buildings, particularly during the pandemic, which can be retrofitted instead of demolition. Such retrofit work is the backbone of many small practices. And hopefully as the UK progresses towards net zero, uh, this will become much more prevalent. This slide shows one of my projects in West London, where I used a new roof extension and a uh, roof garden to create um, passive ventilation through the entire house. 
low energy, reclaimed and recyclable materials and local labor for the construction were used. This small project received many mentions, including being part of the green building exhibition at the Bristol Architecture Center. Some concrete products are classified as lasting for 100 years, yet buildings made of these are being demolished. It was assumed that once upon a time that most modern buildings would be demolished when not needed and something new built instead of them. Some have argued that retrofitting buildings will cost more, so it's better to demolish older buildings and start from scratch. It is possible that some very badly constructed buildings meet that criteria, but it should become mandatory to justify demolishing a building. And if needed, all the demolished bits um, can be harvested and reused rather than sending it to landfill. That again will be an aspect that enables greater design creativity right from the start. Needless to say, good quality materials and construction will be required right from the outset to enable a retrofit. Actually, the UK is a good place to start. So if you look at housing, most of it is Victorian or Georgian, and it is in good condition. Many new buildings, um, but unfortunately, many new buildings assume a building life of 60 years. I don't know why. And this is the architectural equivalent of planned obsolescence. Buildings are expensive. Uh, remember that mortgages are the most expensive thing we're likely to buy in our lifetimes. That is for a reason, because buildings are expensive. We should be slow to demolish buildings and quick to recover waste materials from buildings. Um, Reuse and particularly recycling should be the last resort because, as I said, men, uh, mentioned before, building materials cannot be usefully recycled or reused. Um, in Sweden, they have got a new technique where uh, at, right at the beginning, they classify all the bits of the building. Uh, and then once the building is taken down, they can sell this online. But this is a, at a very, very early stage. It's actually in a research stage. It's not being done so in the meanwhile, before this becomes a reality, we should try and reuse as much as we can. So I've used a lot of words that begin with R-E, re, in this lecture. I hope you made a note. So I'm going to use two more words that I believe are very important. So the first is um, a connection, reconnection, actually. So many building components are made in distant factories. I mean, I didn't know this, but the UK is the largest, a second largest importer of timber products after China. And you'd imagine, you know, UK would have a lot of timber, but as we've just heard before this, that timber prices have gone up because we're exporting that. Um, many building components being made in distant factories, there's a disconnection to the final user. However, in order to ensure an ethical supply chain, architects need to ensure that each part of the supply chain is traceable. Cheap and plentiful labor, particularly in projects abroad, unethical supply um, uh, employment practices, even in the UK, continue to make an unethical supply chain. Use of slave labor can be a punishable offense. An ethical supply chain ensures that both materials and labor can be tracked from start to finish. Um, ensuring that people working on a project are paid fairly and their welfare is very important for the reputation of the architect. And this also falls under the UK Architects Code of Conduct, both ARB and RIBA. There are also, of course, bigger lenses through which architects can look at the impact of their work, such as the UN's 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and the work of the World Resources Institute, a global research organization that works with governments, businesses, and institutions to develop practical solutions that improve people's lives and protect nature. And part of what they do is also look into construction and materials. Presently, there is very little incentive to reduce, recycle, and recycle materials. So that's now the third, the second word. What about reward? 
as the UK moves towards car zero carbon economy, it's important for the government to make home improvements zero VAT. At present, new builds enjoy zero VAT, but extensions and improvements to the home uh, don't. Homeowners would benefit from this, while this would lead to more use of architects to create better, uh, better design solutions. The new London um, architecture, Don't Move, Improve, annual competition showcases the diversity and character of homes being redesigned in London. And this, should be, this sort of thing should be encouraged by the RIBA as well. Along with policy changes, there needs to be more recognition for design that reuse and retrofit. The Pritzker Prize in 2021 went to Lacatan and Basal, a French practice that celebrates reuse of buildings. Their prize citation said that through their ideas, approach to the profession and the resulting buildings, they have proven that a commitment to rest restorative architecture is at once te technological, innovative, and ecological responsive and can be pursued without nostalgia. So how about uh, applying ESG to design awards as well? I would suggest that buildings be considered for awards only after five years of sustained use with completed energy statistics and post-occupancy evaluation. It must also show by what percentage waste was reduced and reused along with energy use. Um, this is the key to reducing carbon emissions. Social it must be shown for projects and governments could include items such as diversity and inclusion within the practice and the community. These measures can become key indicators of design creativity and of design awards. Finally, the last RE is regenerative design. As its name suggests, it's about processes that regenerate or revitalize, another two words using RE, and the energy and materials that have been used. Regenerative design uses whole systems thinking to create resilient, another, another word with RE, and equitable systems that angles from designers, society, and the environment. Consider the work of Theaster Gates, an American artist who has transformed the south side of Chicago by working with people and their needs, reusing buildings and materials, and having a deliberate, thoughtful, and slow approach to building design. This is the this is what the world needs more of. Martin Seligman, the American psychologist, has written about the rampant individualism of people. And this is very much evident in architectural design where iconic buildings are prized and fetid. So my own uh, work has shifted from doing slow and small architecture and working in partnership. This is our Buddhist community center that I worked on. In the refurbishment, we used eco-friendly materials and passive energy features working with a diverse range of people drawn from our community. Nearby is an overground station where we have placed a kitchen garden where the users can plant, take and enjoy what is there. Uh, local schools and local people have actually uh, participated in the upkeep of this uh, small station garden. This work was undertaken with uh, the help of local businesses and um, the station staff will continue to work on this. Um, a small takeaway and community, uh, sorry, a small takeaway library and a community notice board exist at the station. This was put up by a local, another local organization that we worked with. Nearby is a refurbished local cinema created from an abandoned library building. Uh, this wasn't my work. This is another organization that has been working on this, but the people that worked on this project were also working with us on the station project and other things that we're doing now in the second phase of our station, uh, overground station project. In, in the meanwhile, the local council has added planters on the high street to help revitalize and uh, green the local street. In this way, through the efforts of many people and organizations, the community can be rejuvenated. And there's, this is no place for ego or sort of, you know, my design or your design. This is everyone's design that benefits the whole community. So I end with this, desire, with this image that I started with. 
it's the 20th century vision of a world called A Thousand Li of River and Mountains by Wang Ziming, who was a Chinese architect, uh, very prolific. Um, it shows buildings and structures that are immersed in nature. I chose this painting also because it's painted in blue and green, colors of sustainable development. I'm not imagining a romantic, nostalgic view that we go back to the past, but I'm calling for design professionals to design with creativity that can help us remain with the planet and its resources. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Sumita. That was really just a fascinating presentation, both to highlight the urgency of addressing um, intersectional issues around climate and you know systemic injustice, but also providing us with like some tools that we can actually use as architects to intervene within this crisis. And I think so much, so much of the issue is a lot of us, you know, while we care, we feel a bit helpless. Like the system and the problems feel so stacked against us. And I think your work is hugely inspiring to make us feel like there is so many things that we can do. And um, and I've been really impressed. Uh, just by seeing how you've intervened at various in, at various points in the system, whether it's at the policy level, um, at an institutional level, or through your own practice, and also through um, your your charity work as well. And so, I think it's uh, it's interesting to think about like the different ways that we can operate as architects or as agents of change um, in society today, which is kind of what the series is about. It's like it's trying to present these models so that others can learn from them and adopt them. Um, and yeah, I guess maybe it would be to start the questions. I think there's already a question from the audience that I'll get to, but um, in the meantime, just to remind everyone, please post your questions in the chat or raise your hand um, to ask your questions. But um, I guess to get started, I was just curious as to like what set you on this path to like, I think trying to campaign for change and like strive to make the the uh, the, I guess architecture is a discipline, but also a built environment more inclusive is definitely something that that stitches together all the different things in your career. And you talked a bit about your background and how you got here, but I was just curious as to like how you found your voice in um, quite a, a difficult uh, environment and, and also how you figured out your agency to bring about change. Um, yeah, I think I just had to push myself because um, I was quite a shy and timid person, but then you are pushed towards this sort of very desperate thing. You've got to make yourself heard. And I think I'm, I'm guessing that's what happened to me. I gradually kind of pushed myself towards it, towards speaking up. And, um, you know, as I said, you know, I didn't know anyone in the UK. I came here and um, had to work. You just had to, you had to do it. So I think it was that sort of desperation that um, you know enabled me to push forward. Yeah, I mean, I I think that that's also, I guess, important to think about, like how we each find our voices and find a way for us to in, um, individually and collectively change things in the world around us. And I was curious as to you mentioned some of the ways in which, like, some of the tools with which we can change things from, like the materials we use to the, um, how to bring about maybe policy change, but also to think about the different systems that exist in the world today. But I was, um, I guess maybe to also talk a bit about like how, like ways in which people can get involved or um, I guess have access to some of these opportunities or tools that would be interesting to talk about as well. I think it's, it's great when people actually talk together and uh, talk to the community and see what is needed. So I, I think as architects, we tend to sometimes impose our wishes and impose things. But if, if you listen to the community, they'll tell you what they need. So if you can do that, then you're actually part of the community and you'll be useful to the community. And that enables you to do work that is, uh, you know, this triple value that I talked about of goodness, benefit, and, um, um, you know, so it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's about extending yourself and thinking beyond yourself. So this, this idea of um, architects for change, for example, you know, when I came along, I just saw it wasn't just me who was suffering. There was just architects who were suffering. 
but there were also people in the community who you know were suffering so if we could have this forum that would include all of us uh, we're part of society so we could actually be designing for people like us so there's another organization of um, co-founded um, Arch uh, Asian Architects Association and um, you know again you know it's open to everybody Again, you know, I saw this need. There was this um, for an organization that is uh, including people from Asia. So uh, my life has been spent in Asia and there's things happening in Asia that will affect us. Uh, climate change, including ethics, labor. You know, I talked about what's happening in my village. I talked about Vietnam. And um, so I think we need to have those connections. I talked about reconnecting with the world. So if we form these sort of groups and we talk to each other, we're actually you know, also reconnecting with each other. So I think that's really important. I think um, when we reconnect, we become stronger. No, definitely. And actually, I, I loved your use of rewords because for our end of year show at the AA last year, we the theme was re and each unit and program had to pick a reword that best summarized their brief because I think coming out of COVID and all of us having all this time to think about the impact of our lives on the planet, like you could, I think I really enjoyed your discussion about the, the virus as well at the beginning because that's maybe a sign of an ecological imba um, imbalance in the, how it's kind of affected us and the way we operate. And it's been a kind of, um, uh, yeah, like a, a, a maybe a warning signal that we have to change the way we operate now um, more than like in a like few years in the future. So I think um, that kind of connected approach. And I think I totally agree with you in that um, it's probably impossible for architects alone to change things. And it requires the involvement of so many other disciplines. But it's, I think, our ability to bring people together and connect create these connections across disciplines and maybe create um, ways forward. Or like, I think so many of the things you talked about, like even how we incentivize people to reuse rather than build new things through VAT and things like that. I mean, those should be obvious, but they aren't. And I think that's where a way of thinking about systems that our architectural training prepares us for is really interesting. And um, yeah, I mean, obviously you've had a very unique career, but I'm curious in your career as an academic, how how do you kind of, I guess, communicate what you do to students um, to get them to think about their version of, of, of practice that could be aligned with what you've done? Yeah, I think it's, it's really great because I think students are um, kind of thinking in that way. So it's actually, I get inspired by, by them. <laughs> Uh, these days. So it's, it's really lovely to meet students who are really so passionate about the environment because it's, you know, it's their future too. Uh, they're worried about their future. You know, I've got two sons, you know, they're worried about their future. So I, I think if we try to sort of, um, you know, again, you know, this is all about dialogue and, and listening to them. And um, the, for instance, last year, I had a very interesting conversation with someone who was working on a data center. So his, his, his big practice had started working on the data center before the COVID pandemic. And after the COVID uh, pandemic hit, uh, we obviously started using uh, the internet a lot and data centers were needed. And so they decided to double the size of this data center, which is in West London. Now, the problem with data centers is they actually um, uh, take up a lot of energy. They create a lot of heat. And uh, although this was near uh, a water reservoir, they were not using that to discharge the heat. They were just sending it out into the atmosphere. So he had actually not considered the environmental impact. And this was so topical, you know, COVID, into, you know, home working, and yet he hadn't actually connected the two, but we had this great discussion together about what he could do. And he went back to his practice and he started asking the questions about sustainability, which he hadn't asked for. And uh, they made small changes, but unfortunately most of the design was done. And he, in, when I read his case study, he used in part three, I read that he he's going to, in the future, he's going to rethink how he designs data centers because he's actually involved in more data centers and they're going to be considering sustainability. So this is a small, very tiny change, 
but it helped uh, a young person to see how, you know, a, a building can be, I mean, it's not an amazing building. It's basically a shed with all these instruments inside it. It's, it's not amazing architecture, but in terms of its impact on the environment, it does have a, you know, it does have a big impact. So even if we make small changes within our lives, that would be really useful. Definitely. And I think, um, I guess change happens in, at multiple scales, like this kind of small or slower change that can like build up over time and its impact and then kind of bigger change that can happen more quickly with the introduction of a policy or legislation, which takes obviously a long time to make it happen. But um, once it is in existence, at least there's an, a sense of accountability. Um, there's a couple of questions in the in the chat. So um, the first one is from an Alanis who's asked me to ask the question on her behalf. Um, and uh, she said, uh, has asked how embedded should building waste or material management be in government systems? And are there any examples of existing policies in any cities, both pre-construction and post-construction? Um, that, that's a really you know, great question. Um, I think this waste management should now start to be you know, mandatory, it should be, as I said, you know, embedded in the whole process. So, you know, when we're talking about um, energy, you know, whole, um, whole life carbon or embodied energy, we actually think so much about the energy use of the building. We forget that it's, it's you know, it's like fabric first, right? There, there's the fabric first concept. But what is fabric made of? It's made of materials, right? And if we don't consider that, then we actually, um, you know, we, we, can't, we can't use it. So, um, the you know what uh, what we need to do is that we need to consider that right from the beginning material use and examples of existing policies in any cities um i don't know i mean i i i, I don't know perhaps um i can't see who's asked the question is it um just let me see who's the... it's alanis she's oh, alanis, the yeah if um you know if you if you know a, a, of any we would be very happy to hear from you but I'm, I, I don't know of any cities that have actually incorporated that. I mean, they should, you know, people fly tip everywhere. Uh, I've seen, you know, construction waste and particularly during the co uh, pandemic, people were just dumping stuff everywhere, especially where I live. So I think this should be um, an important part of our um, thinking about buildings. Great, thank you. Um, the the next question, I'm going to unmute Ration to ask um, their question. Hi. Um, thank you for the presentation, Samita. It was really um, insightful, and congratulations on your reposition. Um, certainly, since we last spoke, um, I was wanted to ask. Um, you know, given today, you know, there are so many practices struggling with sort of under budgeted um, fees and sort of broader challenges. Of, of the supply chain, cost increases, material increases, you know, how do you incentivize, how do you advise, you know, architects and designers sort of incentivize going for the more complex, you know, at times more expensive um, practice of, of, you know, uh, more responsible sort of um, practice, you know? Um, yeah, that's also a really great question. I think we'll be forced to do that because you know, as, as materials become more and more expensive, we'll have to start thinking about how much of the material we use. So that's going to happen. And um, I think that's actually a way that we can promote the work of architects. You know, this is how architects bring value to design. You know, this is this, this sort of thing, you know, you know how people sort of, um, uh, you know, draw stuff or, um, you know, clients don't use. So the so basically the title of the architect is protected, but the function of the architect is not protected. So anybody can make any sort of drawings and, and take it to the council and get that through. But if, if the council were to make this mandatory, you know, looking at waste and looking at good design that saves on material use, et cetera, then people will say, okay, well, I need an architect. So it actually increases the value of architects. And as you know, I think it's about 68% of projects that are done in the UK are done by small practices. So who are doing these sort of works like, you know, extensions, et cetera. So I think, you know, um, it will be good for them as well to, um, to be able to do that. 
So I'm, I'm hoping that this is how we show we add value to uh, building rather than actually something that, um, you know, uh, makes things, uh, makes life difficult for us. Thanks, Samitha. There's um, another question from Holly. Oh, I'm just going to ask her to unmute. Sorry, Holly, you're still on mute. You have to unmute. Apologies, I thought you were doing it at your end. Thank you, Manu J. Thank you so much. Um, Professor Samita, this is an amazing talk. Um, I've loved it. I'm not actually an architect, but um, I wasn't actually going to mention this. I am married to an architect. We're not currently together. This is a great passion of mine. I grew up in South Africa and have lived in Australia and currently in the UK. We live in a very old building, an old manse, and um, I would love to see all sorts of work done to it. But I'm very passionate about what you've been saying. And we have an acre of organic biodiverse garden. And um, when you mentioned the data centers in London, I wondered whether it might be possible for them to be covered with vertical plantings. I know there is at least one company in London doing that, going around covering the outsides of buildings. And I wondered whether that might offset the issues that are being created by all of that heat, um, which I presume is going up. And so wouldn't actually harm the plants, but the plants would help to clean the air and so on. So I'm not sure. Is that, a po is that something that's possible? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting idea, I think, uh, surely. But I, I think the, the problem with these, uh, uh, these um, machines is that they generate the heat. And if you, you can't put plants on them because that would then block the ventilation. So you need air circulation as well to remove the heat. But this heat, I'm thinking, you know, like in the old days, used to like the Battersea um, Centre, you know, the power centre, the heat uh, from there was used to heat up homes. And I'm thinking in the modern way, could we use the heat from data centers to actually heat up homes? Because why should it just go into the atmosphere doing nothing? So I think it needs some kind of, as I said, you know, design creativity to think about how we can use these resources that we're just simply wasting now, sending it to space. Yeah. Uh, crazy. Well, I'm, I'm right there with you and, um, I've been spending quite a lot of time on Clubhouse and um, have a bit of a following there. So I would be very happy to help in any way if we can bring groups of people together and, you know, talk and share. Um, and perhaps the public can bring some of their thoughts to the architects, because, as you said, what you're doing is having such a massive impact on the planet. It's not just one pocket of professional professional focus, it is massively impacting the planet. So um, yeah, if I can do anything to help in my very small way, I'd be delighted. Thank you so much. Thank you, Holly. And thank you, Holly, for um, publicizing the talk as well. I saw that we're, we're on LinkedIn and you-, you That's right. Well. Thank you very much. Um, I just, <laughs> thank you. And um, there's someone who's written that my understanding is the North Norfolk sand engineering comes from dredging the great Yarmouth shipping channels. So it's very local, but um, interesting, um, you know, is dredging uh, the shipping channels um, a good thing or a bad thing? Is dredging a good thing, bad thing? That's something we have to kind of think about, isn't it? Um, is it destroying some kind of, uh, you know, natural um, you know, thing at the bottom that was there? Uh, people do also, I mean, there's a, as we speak, I think this evening there is a dredger that's been held up with the EU dispute, um, I was hearing on the news. And I'm thinking, okay, well, apparently it was um, dredging legally in the fishing areas that UK is allowed, but um, I'm thinking, is dredging good for the natural life, you know, uh, for, the, for the sea life? Because it's actually literally scraping all the bits of the ocean, uh, the seafloor, and, and taking everything out uh, over whether we need it or not. So, yes. So we have to think about the good and bad and whether we really need to do this dredging or not. I think that's where the, the ecological approach is really important to understand how everything is connected and part of a bigger ecology because that I guess then you understand that it's not just 
one practice, but all of the systems that are connected through dredging that are impacted by that action. Um, we have another question from um, Razia. Uh, I'm just going to unmute them so they can ask the question. Sorry, I hope I pronounced your name. Okay. Yeah, you, you did announce it right. I'm Razia. Uh, right now I'm here in Istanbul. So um, we are actually architecture students. So first of all, really thank you for the presentation. It was really informative right now in our case. So we are working actually now in Istanbul at the part of Kadıköy and our theme is circular architecture. And as we realized, there are really a lot of projects going around in Kadıköy supported from the government. But actually, the locals do not really support them or even know about anything about them. So uh, here is actually my question. How can we make the locals as a part of this whole cycle? And how can we really open people's eyes in how important ecological circulation and being a part of this cycle is? Because uh, we also saw that in the past, um, there was this exchange economy during their neighborhood, like they give their eggs or milk, etc. So we lost with the urbanization, this uh, circular economy, not with the urbanization, but um, we lost the practice of it. So how can we really, again, uh, put this whole importance to this area right now? So this is actually my question. Thank you very much. I hope it's not too cold. You look <laughs> like you're freezing outside. Um, okay. No, no, it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Razia. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, it comes from dialogue and that's how we started. It, you know, it's a very slow process, very frustrating because we often have issues, you know, I'm just, re you know, doing the second phase of the um, uh, station project and it's so frustrating sometimes, I just want to just throw in everything and just move off, but you have to keep talking to people. And the other thing is to connect the personal, you know, when you actually connect uh, the personal, your personal story to something that's much bigger, you make it political. So, you know, the fact that, you know, that sand where my father played as a little baby is no longer available for his funeral ceremonies for me was very, very, uh, it made me angry. And that's why I showed that slide because it was about connecting um, that some, uh, a personal thing to a much wider thing that's happening around the world. And I, I just really want to know where that sand has gone. You, know, you could see, so it's in, uh, along the entire river course and it's all gone. Where has it gone to? You know, it's just beautiful sand. And I took my children there. I said, I'm going to show you something really special. And I took them to the river and we saw this. And I was so angry. So I think it's part of what you are doing, what you're seeing. What, what is it that, you know, you feel uh, connected to? What is it that really speaks to your heart? Go and follow that and then take it up and, you know, get together with people, talk to them. You will find people will have lots in common you know, I wasn't really aware of the San Mafia before I saw what had happened to the riverbank. And, um, and I became aware and I became angry and I want to do something about it. So I'm bringing these images to the Western audience to say, look, this is what's happening. You know, I mean, two, uh, I think it was two million tons of sand. I'm not sure if that would come from just dredging the shipping channels. It must have come from somewhere else. And the sand that settles to the bottom is, is quite rough. It's not as fine as it was shown in the beach photographs. Anyway, it will be interesting to find out, and I will find out. So it's, it's a thing, you know, you, you find out what's, what it is that's happen, uh, happening around you, what's affecting the local community, and how you connect to the wider world. You know, there are loads of things happening in, in Turkey, for example, you know, I've, I've seen um, with building materials, you know, some of the concrete products that was listed in e EPD uh, come from Turkey, actually. So you could try and find out where is this sand coming from? Where is this cement coming from? How is it manufactured? Um, you know, because I, I, I couldn't see it. I think it's a, it was a great question. So thank you so much, Razia. 
But um, I also think, um, I think you raised two really interesting issues, Samita, on, um, I guess, how the personal can become political, but also, um, like, how do you visualize the impact of, like, our practices right now? And um, to go back to your use of the Bosch triptych, I think what's so amazing about that painting is like how little is known about Bosch's intentions, and so how much each of us can project onto it, which is why it's such an amazing reference. So I used that painting as a reference for a project that I did recently. Um, and I saw it as a kind of uh, the triptych being like, you know, looking at a kind of utopia on the left, a dystopia on the right, and a kind of middle ground. Um, where we currently are. So we, it's a point, it's a kind of fork in the road where we have an option of like, do we head towards this like possible future that doesn't look so great? Or do we try and change things and open up? In my case, I was looking at privatized public space and open up space for people to look at. But I really loved your interpretation, which was like really looking at um, how this isn't a space of delight at all. Um, and uh, I guess a lot of climate activists say that well, there's so much data about climate change and its impact, data doesn't seem to be reaching people or turning that into action. And I, I think um, it's, and that's why I think they were saying that they would love to work with architects or image makers to just try and visualize the impact on the planet and on, on people's lives. Because as you said, all of these people with money who are spending it and like are responsible for a bulk of the, of the carbon output, um, they don't want to change their actions and they don't understand the impact of it maybe fully. So I think that, I think the, the use of the triptych in, in, in imaging the after effect or the impact is maybe really important. And I was just curious, what are the tools to do that and how to get people to, to as I think as an extension of what Razia asked, like how to really get people to care. So like how to make this feel personal to everyone is a real challenge. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, no, I, I, it's interesting how you saw the triptych and how I saw the triptych. And actually, my son, who has studied art history, he saw it in a completely different way as well. So um, the thing with the triptych is, if you look carefully, there are some uh, people with dark skins in it. and uh, But the majority are white. And I also took it as an example of colonial uh, greed as well, you know, just overrunning the, over, overrunning the planet. And uh, Hieronymus Bosch, he he does he does um, he painted these things to predict what might happen, and so for me it was a predictive painting of where humankind is is moving to. But uh, yeah, so to try and uh, involve people, how do we make it political? How do we create that image that actually grasps? Uh, it's very interesting, you know, this thing about carbon footprint. Now. Um, perhaps not many people know this, this idea of carbon foot footprint was actually started by British Petroleum. Did, did, do people know this? So they, they had a 250 million pound campaign and it was Ogilvy and Mather that came up with this idea of um, having a carbon footprint and making people personally responsible for producing carbon. So I, I remember seeing this advert in the 90s and it went like, do you know your carbon footprint? <laughs> and I was thinking, what is carbon footprint? And now we talk about carbon footprint in a very casual, um, like everybody knows what it is. But it, it's a very clever thing because it shifted the blame from larger corporations onto individual you know, people and made them feel very guilty for taking a flight. And, you know, just today, for example, the chancellor um, of the Exchequer, has, he's announced that um, domestic flights will have their taxes cut, whereas international uh, flights will have their taxes increased. Now, I'm thinking, well, you know, I have to go and see my family. I don't fly in the UK. If I have to go somewhere in the UK or in Europe, I'd take the train. So why, why cut the taxes here? You know, and, and also aviation contributes about 2.5% of greenhouse gases. Now I'm saying it's not a good thing to fly, but I mean, if I could take the train from here to, um, to go to India, I would. And I have taken the train to go from London to Istanbul. But beyond Istanbul, you enter places like Iraq and Afghanistan and Pakistan, which are all being destabilized by the West. You know, so you can't, you can't go in, it's dangerous. So having made it dangerous for us, now 
they're saying to people, well, you can't fly there because, you know, it's carbon emissions and all that. So anyway, the, I, I won't go into that. So this, um, I think the, the ESG infographic that I showed is quite interesting because it does show all the different aspects that impact on them, on, you know, on your personally as well outside yourself. So the environmental, the social and the governance aspects. And, you know, for example, the shareholders, they ask these questions within gov governance, you know, they are um, asking, you know, how are, you know, about ethics, about pay, and there is some kind of um, online petition about pay um, for Amazon and all other, uh, even John Lewis, I saw some petition for John Lewis as well. So people are asking those questions about governance. They're not connecting that much with the environment, as you say. You know, they did the survey, only 38% people said, you know, they would make lifestyle changes. All the others said they don't want to make lifestyle changes. So I think it's this idea of giving up their comfort in order to help others. And there is perhaps also a, a slight xenophobic uh, attitude to that as well. You know, as long as it's not happening here, it's okay. You know, we can... Um, doesn't matter what's happening to the rest of the world, but we have to start this connection. And the way we can start connection is showing images, showing the, you know, all these stats about how people's lives are being affected. You know, the thing about um, uh, the Africa, uh, the whole continent, um, you know, just uh, having producing three percent of the carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases. And then may, having to now do 50% of climate adaptation for the structures that are there. And that, and that is really unfair. But the, you know, people don't think about like that. You know, they just think, oh, we're doing our bit. All the, you know, Europe's doing it. What about India and China? And as you saw in that graph from Jason Hickel, India and China don't appear in that graph at all. So I think um, showing those kind of graphs, showing the images of uh, sand mining, showing images of suffering around the world. And I think today I was just, just before this lecture, there was a floods um, in Cumbria on there. And people are, I mean, there's the image of this river rushing through where two, where two rivers have combined is horrific. I just saw it just before the lecture. And I thought, if that doesn't make climate change real for you, nothing will. No, I mean, I, I completely agree. And I, I think it's great that you've touched on the fact that um, I, I only read about this recently, that um, the whole move to shift responsibility onto the individual for climate change was actually started by BP. And um, it's just, I think it's led to a, a bigger problem, which, as you say, is like the oversimplification of the argument on climate. And it ends up becoming a very privileged conversation where people whose families live in a very like small radius to them um, say that they're never going to fly again. Whereas people like us, whose families live like across the world, like I, I will never be able to see my family again if I can't fly. So um, it, it's just strange. And the, this taxation thing is so um, narrow in its view. And also it just, I think that there are lots of benefits from travel that have connected us. And instead we should be looking into fossil fuel alternatives or investing money and research into that. And I just, it feels like the conversation becomes very small and insular rather than thinking of the bigger system, which is why, again, going back to the name of your practice, but uh, this word ecology, like really understanding the bigger system. And I think, as you say, like the relative um, you know, contributions to, to carbon emissions from each of the different countries, the unequal distribution of these forces across the planet and like how a problem created in one part of the world is going to be experienced much more by another part. It's like a huge inequality and therefore a very kind of intersectional issue. So I just think that your the, the hard hitting facts coupled with the strategies you've come up with are a really amazing combination. And I hope that there are more and more platforms where you get to talk about this to kind of really uh, I guess um, inspire people to to do something about this and to like also ask their governments to to to, to like actually commit to this. And it, I think, above all, your last point shows how reductive the the Paris Agreement or this fifty percent, like how reductive it is to look at things in terms of percentages, um, because it's so unequal in terms of a percentage of you know, 3% of a contribution is so much different to 50% of 50 percent of the contribution. So I think um, they've given us so much to think about. Um, I am conscious of time. So I, 
I, I, as much as I would love to keep chatting to you all evening, um, I just wanted to, to maybe just say thank you to you for such an inspiring talk. And, um, and I guess hope that it can continue on all of these other platforms and forums going forward. Thank you very much for inviting me and thanks for all the questions and all the people that attended. Now you can go and spread the message. Definitely. Um, I guess because we're still stuck on Zoom, um, which is both a positive and a negative in that it enables people to join from all over, like Istanbul and, you know, even further afield. So um, I just, I'm going to try and do a mass unmute so everyone can give you a round of applause. So one second. So I've asked everyone to unmute so we can give you a clap. I'll, I'll clap for <laughs> I'm very grateful. Thank you so Thank much. You.